Little Church uh, Spring Picnic. We always have a great time. We go out to Pattison, Texas, which is the home of Orlando Salas, who pastors a uh, Spanish-speaking church out in, in Brookshire, and uh, his wife, is, they've been live streamers, and they've been part of this congregation for, uh, for many years, and so we go out there. There's sign-up sheets out in the fellowship hall. We have a great time. We play a variety of different games. He's built a volleyball court out there when his daughter was in high school on the volleyball team, and he built a pickleball court, and so there's a lot of room for the kids to run around, and we have a great time and uh, great food. So we look forward to seeing everybody there. Also, the next Sunday is the annual March of Remembrance in relation to Holocaust Remembrance Day, and it's a great opportunity to sign up, participate in that. Uh, they have some uh, some speakers, and then we walk about a mile, and so the whole idea is to show uh, support for the Jewish community and uh, remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust. The locations to be announced, at least the starting point, I'm not sure where that'll be, but it'll be down in the Rice University area because it ends at Temple Emmanuel, which is down in that area. Also, for those who are going to, on the Bible Museum trip, you need to get your information sheet in, which includes the payment of the uh, a minimum payment of the $12 fee plus the other, uh, whatever other uh, short tours that you want to participate in. And so if you'd please get that information in, that would be great. And then also, I'll be sending out some updates on the Israel trip. So that's what's going on. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, as usual, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so we can all make sure that we are uh, in right relationship with the Lord in case we have any, any sins or mental attitude sins or verbal sins that we uh, <coughs> engaged in on the way here fighting traffic. I'm sure that applies to some people. There may be other sins if necessary. We can confess those, make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord before we begin our study of the Lord's Word. So let's begin with a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful we can come together this evening to fellowship around the study of your word. Father, we, as we came together tonight, we were uh, bringing several requests before your throne of grace in prayer meeting. A couple of those to highlight. We continue to pray for uh, Jim Dumas in uh, Kiev. Pray that his health will improve. The doctors will identify what the problem is. We're glad that so far they haven't uh, confirmed his uh, diagnosis from Houston, and so he is... Um, uh, it just doesn't seem to be as serious or severe as it was once once thought. Uh, Father, we also pray for Jim Myers as he leaves, uh, has just returned from Brazil, and now he leaves this Friday to go for uh, two weeks of teaching in Zambia. We pray for his health and his safety and that his ministry there will be quite uh, spiritually profitable. Father, we continue to pray for the students there at the Word of God Bible College, and we pray for uh, them, as, uh, especially the second-year students, will be wrapping up their studies uh, coming this May. Father, we pray for us that we might be diligent students of your Word, uh, not only learning what it says, but understanding how to apply it in our lives, how it transforms our thinking, shapes the way we look at the world around us as we understand a consistent Christian worldview from the Scripture. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 6, so let's start off by going there, and we will review just a little bit, and then I want to take us through an, sort of an application type of study this evening. Last week, we went through the first 11 verses of the chapter in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and that had to do with taking, moving the Ark of the Covenant from its resting spot that really had been there 
for uh, the entire, at least the entire length of Saul's reign. Uh, there's a passage I looked at, la we looked at last time, said 20 years. I think that's 20 years before Saul's reign. So that's 20 plus 40 plus uh, seven and a half years for David. So that's uh, quite uh, at least 67 years and um, could have been a little bit longer that the ark was just, and as David said in Chronicles, that they had not uh, paid attention to the ark. They just ignored the ark uh, during this, this time. So now he is refocusing their attention back on the ark of the covenant and moving it to to Jerusalem to bring the ark back together with the tabernacle. And so just a reminder as we look at the outline in this first part we're still in the middle of the first section between 2 Samuel 2 to 10 we see God blessing David and um, David unites and expands the kingdom but it is of course God who's uniting and expanding the kingdom. And then in the next section from verse uh, from chapter 11 to 20, God will bring discipline upon David for his sins, the great sin of uh, adultery with Bathsheba, and also uh, the conspiracy to have her husband killed once her pregnancy is discovered. And then David will truly will confess his sin and then truly uh, repent, which means to change his mind, to turn from it and turn to God. And as a result, God doesn't remove the discipline, but he transforms the cursing into blessing. So we see how David will use uh, the promises of God and the provision of God to uh, deal with the discipline that comes his way. And then the last part, the uh, uh, appendices. Now, what we've seen in this first section is the beginning of David's kingdom and then God giving David control over Jerusalem. And we trace that through the Old Testament that God has put his, his heart on Jerusalem. He loves Jerusalem. He's chosen Jerusalem as his dwelling place. And that Jerusalem doesn't, doesn't have any uh, political value. It doesn't have any military value. It doesn't have any economic value. But this is the location where God has, has set his love. And so this goes back. Um, the tradition among the Jews is it goes back beyond Abraham. Scripturally, we can only say it goes back to Abraham in Genesis uh, chapter 22. Uh, actually goes back before that, I think, to Genesis uh, chapter 14, where David gives tithes to uh, Melchizedek, who is the priest king of Jerusalem, who worships El Elyon, who is the great God, the powerful God, the maker of heaven and earth, which is quite distinctive a phrase because in the ancient world, no pagan religions believed in a, a deity, a monotheistic deity who is the creator of the heavens and the earth who is distinct from his creation. And so that really set Melchizedek apart from all of the pagan cultures and pagan kings. And Abraham recognizes that they worship the same God. So he gives 10% of the plunder, which doesn't belong to him. It belongs to the king of Sodom, but he gave 10% of it a tithe to Melchizedek. And so that's covered in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 14. All of this shows that God has a long-range plan for Jerusalem. Now, according to Jewish legend, that uh, location where the ark will eventually reside on Mount Moriah on what is called the foundation stone, that that is uh, the, where the Garden of Eden was located. But that's Jewish legend. That's not what the scripture says. But it's clear that God has a focus on that geography as, uh, as a location for his presence, which is going to be in the first temple until he removes it. So God gives David control over Jerusalem. All of this is working towards a plan. Jerusalem may not have a political or an economic or military advantage, but it has a spiritual significance that is David's focal point. And then we see that David brings the ark to Jerusalem. This is the, where God is enthroned between the cherubs on the Ark of the Covenant, and so this is the key, the true king of Israel is going to uh, be brought to his throne in Jerusalem. 
And so we looked at how David uh, selected uh, 30 men. He gathered 30 choice men. Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles 13 gives us a little more uh, information on that. He organizes them as a military escort during this great parade to bring the Ark of the Covenant uh, in from Kiriath Jerim, which is about six or eight miles from, uh, from Jerusalem, into Jerusalem. And this is a map where we, uh, I pointed out that it, uh, once he expanded his military control out to Gezer, then uh, Kiriath Jerim, which is located halfway between Je- the old uh, Canaanite city of Jebus, now Jerusalem, uh, that is the distance that they have to bring the Ark of the Covenant. And then what we did was we looked at the history of the, uh, of the Ark, that it had been residing in the house of Abinadab in, um, in kiriath Jerim. God had, had blessed him and his house there. And then the Ark is brought to, uh, to Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that I emphasize is that God instructed Israel in terms of who could move the ark and how they were to move the ark. And the point that I keep coming back to in this is that God has specific ways in which we are to worship him, in which we are to uh, walk with him, in which we're to live our Christian life. And the same thing was true in the Old Testament. There were these very specific things that were to be done. That God is not a God who just sort of winks at us and says, well, anything goes as long as you are sincere, as long as you are are doing what you think you need to do to worship me, then it's okay. God has very specific plans. He has specified uh, these things in Scripture. He's revealed how we are to worship him, and he doesn't accept anything less because it all relates ultimately to understanding his character that a righteous God cannot have fellowship, cannot enjoy fellowship, cannot enjoy the relationship with his creatures unless the sin problem is taken care of. And that means that all creatures must adjust to the righteous standard of God. And we do that, first of all, at salvation, by trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when we do that, we're instantly given the righteousness of Christ. It's imputed to us, the Scripture says. It's reckoned to our account so that God declares us justified or righteous, not because of what we've done, but because of what but because we possess Christ's righteousness. So that's the basis for adjusting to God's righteousness at salvation. And then when we live our life after we become a believer, then we have to continuously adjust to his righteousness whenever we sin. In the Old Testament, it was through sacrifices and confession for, for cleansing. It was demonstrated ritually through the sacrifices. It was demonstrated in personal Uh, in the personal spiritual life by confession. That's made clear in the life of David when he confessed his sin with Bathsheba uh, in Psalm Psalm 51. So the ark and the travails and travels of the ark tell us something about God's righteousness and justice, which is really the focal point of uh, the lesson this evening. So God had specific ways that the ark was to be moved. So he described how the ark was to be transported, and he described who was authorized to move the ark, because this is the scene of his presence. So in Numbers 4, 4, 5, and 6, we saw that it's going to be Aaron's sons, Aaron and his sons, the high priests, who who will take down the veil as you would go into the Holy of Holies, The ark is the only furniture in the Holy of Holies. They would take down the veil and they would put it over the ark of the covenant. And so nobody could look at it. Nobody could gaze at it. It's completely covered. And then they would have poles that were inserted in the rings on each side of the box. You can see the the poles and rings here in this uh, depiction of the ark of the covenant. 
So that's one thing they had to do. Exodus 25, 15 says, The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be removed. They are there permanently. So they would cover it, and then this is how they would carry it. The other thing that we learn in Deuteronomy 10, 8, is that it was only Levites, only those from the tribe of Levi, uh, that is the priests, who were authorized to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And in number 7, 9, we're told how they were to carry it, which was on their shoulder. Now, what's interesting is while is that, that it's carried by Levites as they take the Ark into Jerusalem, but it's not carried properly, and it is mishandled along along the way. So what we saw before, and we'll just look at this map, is that the Ark was captured by the Philistines at the first battle of Aphek here. The Israelites had treated it like a good luck charm, and after they were initially defeated, they sent back to Shiloh, and they said, bring up the Ark, and they brought up the Ark. Now, we're not told in that account if they did it according to procedure. Uh, we're not told if they covered it with the, with the uh, veil. We're not told if it was carried on the shoulders. Apparently none of that per was significant in terms of how, how they carried it, but uh, they, were myth they were abusing the purpose for the ark, and so the result is that they were defeated and the ark was captured uh, by the Philistines. And then it goes through this. Well, let me go back to the map. It goes, it's taken down to Ashdod, and then the ark is taken from there to Gath, and along the way, there are all these humorous things that take place as God shows that even though he's been captured, he's still in control, that God's, God's stability, God's control of the situation is not dependent upon man at all. He's captured, he's put inside the temple of Dagon, who the next morning is found bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. They stand him back up, the Philistines stand him back up, the next day he's bowing down, his hands and his feet are cut off so he can't be uh, put back up, and showing that he has been completely rendered impotent by the God of, of the Israelites. And so after it goes through these these places at Gath and Ekron, we'll come back and talk about what was going on there a little later on. Then it's taken, they put it on a cart with a milch cow, and it's taken to Beth Shemesh. And there again, the uh, Beth Shemites are um, treated with disrespect. They sacrifice to it. They do some other things that are right, but ultimately they treat it with disrespect. They're looking at it. They're taking the lid off. They're looking inside. And so God struck down all the people. And the text says in one place 50,000 and 70. There's a textual corruption there, so we're not sure the exact number. Uh, Beth Shemesh is in a big, uh, large town, so maybe the number 70 is the more correct number. And uh, what we see here is a foreshadowing of what happens as David is bringing the ark into Jerusalem. Because the question that is asked, especially by modern critics and unbelievers of the scripture, is, well, this is so harsh. How is this a loving God? How can God be so cruel and mean? They were just trying to do the right thing. They were sincere in their hearts, and God s strikes down 70 of them dead, or 50,000 and 70 of them dead. And that's not a very loving or caring God. And so what we see in modern uh, liberal the theological thinking since the 19th century is to juxtapose the love of God with the righteousness and justice of God, and not, not comprehending or willing to accept the fact that the love of God is completely compatible with his righteousness and justice, and a love that is not righteous or just, that lacks integrity, is not a very good love at all. And a righteousness and a justice that is not tempered at the same time with true love is, is, becomes an overbearing tyranny. So you have this perfect balance within the character of God. You know, we break down the attributes of God only for academic study, but they are totally interconnected and interrelated in the one person of God, just as your 
attributes are interconnected and interrelated in your uh, personal life. You may be honest, you may be a hard worker, you may be a person who is a uh, uh, has a tendency, tendency to be subjective or a person who tends to be objective or more analytical, but all of those characteristics make up you as one person. They're not mutually contradictory. They make up your personality, who you are, and they blend together. You can talk about a person's attributes or characteristics for academic purposes, but in reality they're all uh, blended together, and the same is true for God's character, for his righteousness and justice. So, after the ark leaves, or has this little episode at Beth Shemesh, then uh, the Beth Shemeshites are uh, understandably fearful of this God who has taken the life, struck dead 70 or 50,000 and 70 of their people, and they want the people of Kiriath Jerim to take this hot potato, as it were, off their hands. And so the ark of the Lord we saw was brought into the house of Abinadab on the hill. This is in the, the, um, at Kiriath Jerim. And he consecrates his son Eleazar, or Eleazar, uh, to keep the ark of the Lord. Now, what do we know about Abinadab? There are three Abinadabs in the Bible, in the Old Testament. One is the brother of David who's mentioned in 1 Samuel 16, 8. Another one it was one of the sons of Saul who died on Mount Gilboa. And then this is the third one who's only mentioned here in 1 Samuel 7 and then in 2 Samuel 6. He is, it's not indicated in Scripture what his lineage was that he was a priest, but his son's name is Eliezer, which would indicate that was the son of Aaron, which would indicate that he was a probably of the priestly line. Josephus, an extra biblical source, does identify uh, Abinadab as a Levite. And so uh, the text indicates that he, he is blessed. He, he keeps the ark there, and God doesn't bring discipline on the house, which he would if they were violating um, the standard. So uh, he consecrates his, his uh, El- Eliezer would be the oldest son, consecrates him, sets him apart to keep the ark of the Lord. So we covered through most of that last time, as well as getting into the specifics of the first 11, 11 verses. And the point of these first 11 verses is that God demonstrates that he is holy, that he is in control, and he is sufficient. Now that's really important. That's a mouthful, but that's really important. God is demonstrating he doesn't need any help from anybody else, and that he must be dealt with or treated in a manner that is, uh, that, that is consistent with his, his instructions that he is not a God who can be controlled. He is not a God that is to be manipulated by, uh, by the, the Israelites. He is not a God that people can manipulate. He is uh, very much in control of the situation, and he is not necessarily going to behave in the way that we think he should behave. And, and that's one of the interesting things that sets the Bible apart from other religious literature. You can go back into the ancient world and you can look at the histories, for example, Egyptian history, you can look at uh, Babylonian history, and Persian history, Arab history, things that go back into the Old Testament period. And what you read is that, that when, um, when, you, uh, when they were engaged in battles, they, they always won. They were never, never, ever uh, defeated, and as as a matter of fact, if there is a um, today, this just shows you the kind of thinking that often occurs today as well as then. There is a square in Cairo where there is a monument that is uh, dedicated to the Egyptian victory over the Israelis in the uh, '67 war in the Six-Day War. Now, y'all know what happened, don't you? 
is that on the first day of the Six Day War, the the uh, is, Israelis uh, attacked, knowing that the Egyptians were going to attack. They attacked first, and they wiped out uh, within the first three or four hours. They wiped out the Egyptian air force, and and the Six Day War was a resounding defeat for the Egyptians. But they've rewritten history. You know, here's a monument to their victory over the over the Israelites. I mean, over over the Israelis. So this is um, not uncommon at all in the ancient world that when uh, people, when kings and emperors had their chronicles written, they often would embellish and they would, uh, in fact, just totally uh, twist the facts to show how great and wonderful they were. And in some cases, when they came into power, they would erase other pharaoh's names from monuments and from pyramids and other things and then they would put their name on it as if they had done that. So this kind of propaganda and fake news is not new to this generation or, uh, or this century. So God doesn't behave like that, though. When you look at the Scripture and you read the lives of Abraham and Moses and David, we see them warts and all. We, we learn about the fact that sometimes God deserted the Israelites. Sometimes he let the Is- Israelites get completely defeated uh, by their enemies. That uh, sometimes God uh, brought great plagues on them. God is not under the control of man. And that is something that is, um, that is seen in this whole, uh, whole episode. It reminds me of an episode in the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I th- it's also in the film, but it's, te- which if you're not familiar with that, it came out about 10 years ago and tells the story of four children who go through a wardrobe and end up in this magical kingdom of Narnia. C.S. Lewis wrote it as a children's book as sort of an allegory, as a Christian allegory that was compar- uh, comparable to, to uh, the kingdom of God. And the ruler of the real ruler of Narnia is a lion, t- taken from the lion uh, of Judah, and so the lion's name is Aslan. And in the uh, story, uh, as it talks about this kingdom, and it talks about uh, the Christ figure represented by the lion Aslan, the Narnia, and uh, I mean the children meet. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and they have a conversation, and and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are describing this mighty lion to them, and the little girl Lucy says, "Is he a man?" And Mr. Beaver replies, "Aslan, a man? Certainly not. I tell you, he is king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts?" Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, that's the older girl. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I just think that's a, such a great episode because that's what most people want to think about God, that he's safe, that he, they can control him, that if they do this, God will do that and things like that, and they can make a deal with God. But what we learn from the Scripture is God isn't safe. God is really quite different from anything we can fully imagine and not like the gods of any of the kingdoms or anywhere else. And this is what David is having to grapple with because when the ark is brought in to Jerusalem and the cart that it's brought on in violation of the instructions in in the Torah, when the ark is brought in and it hits this bump in the road and the ark is jostled, then one of the two sons of Abinadab, 
will reach out and try to stabilize it. Now, Abinadab, as I said, is um, a priestly line. He's got a son, Abin, he's got a son uh, Eliezer, who's put in charge of, but we don't hear anything about them being present, so maybe they're both dead by this time. And his two other sons um, are present there. There is Uzzah, who is there, and there is um, uh, Nacon, uh, no, not Nacon, I forget the name of the other of the other brother but these two brothers are there and they're present with the ark and uh, and so Uzzah reaches out to stabilize and God immediately takes his life and I want you to read what happens is verse 7 and the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Now remember that, it's the God's outbreak. Perez means outbreak. The outbreak against Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. So God's presence is there, and the response of David is one of fear. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Think about that question. We're going to see that that echoes other questions. So, I'll skip through this, these slides. <clears throat> so, what we've, where we finished last time, we are just talking about what happened, that the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. So the question I want to address and answer tonight is, why then is David angry? God is not controlled or safe. That's really the issue. Why is David angry? Because God can't be controlled and he's not safe. What we see in the scripture is that fear toward God is the response of the fallen human who is confronted with the presence of God. That's what we see here. Where else do we see this kind of response? Let's sort of walk our way through uh, through the Old Testament. The first example is in the Garden of Eden. So I want you to turn with me and let's go back. I refer to this quite a bit, but let's look at the passage this time in Genesis chapter 3. What has happened is that the serpent has come along and the serpent has tempted uh, Eve to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She has eaten and then uh, she offers it to her husband, to Adam. And so we'll pick up there in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. I just want you to notice how crisp that narrative is. Doesn't go into a lot of detail, tells us a lot in a very few words. And the result is given then in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? See, what happens is the presence and the reality of God provokes something deep within the human soul. It's this existential fear that develops, a dread because we're lost, because we're, we're spiritually dead and separated from God. We're not meant to live or to have real life apart from God. And we're lonely, isolated, and exposed. And so then the Lord God comes to, uh, in the, comes to them in the garden, and in verse 9 we read, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, 
where are you? And the man replied in verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. He's exposed. It's not just that he is without clothes. He's totally exposed now as a creature designed to be totally dependent upon God. That ability and that dependency upon God is is gone and he's just left with nothing. And so he, he says, I, I, I was naked and I hid myself. And, and uh, the, the basic emotion that's there is that he was afraid. Now, I would imagine that if I were to ask a vocabulary quiz for most of you and said, what's the opposite of fear? You probably wouldn't come up with the biblical answer. So I want to look at a couple of verses in 1 John that give us some insight into what's going on. What are the mechanics here in terms of what goes on in the soul? 1 John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, the word heart here doesn't refer to emotions. Often that's how people use it today. But that's, it, it's talking about the core of our being, the, the center of our soul. And as part of our soul, we have a conscience that knows right from wrong. And what, happens when, what happened when Adam heard God in the garden he knows he's done wrong. He has violated God's standard. And so his conscience convicts him. And because he know, therefore knows that he has done wrong, then it, his heart, his conscience condemns him for doing wrong. And then John is saying, but God is greater than our heart. God knows everything. We can't hide from him. We can't cover up our sin. God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Now, the next verse I want to look at is also in 1 John. It's in the next chapter in 1 John 4.18. In 1 John 4.18, John is saying, there's no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear. Now, most of us would juxtapose hate with love, but what we see here is fear is juxtaposed to love. That perfect love here is a mature biblical love, the kind of divine love that God has, and it's only that love and what it provides that can deal with the basic attitude of the human soul, which is fear. There is a fear of punishment at the heart of every human being. I think that is a core motivation that people try to cover up. They try to deny it. That it's, it's part of their understanding of the existence of God. And so uh, John says, because fear has to do with punishment. We're afraid because we know existentially in the core of our being that we're wrong, that we should be punished that we are sinful, we have violated uh, God's standard. Now, a lot of people are going to debate you about that. They're going to say, no, no, I don't believe in God, and I'm not afraid, and I'm just as happy as I can be, because they've been practicing for years in, in sort of a form of self-hypnosis to convince themselves that the lie is true. And, and we're going to go to Romans 1.18 in just a minute uh, to deal with that. But this is what 1 John says. The one who fears punishment has not been matured. That's what the word perfected means there, in love. And so the only way to overcome that, that orientation of the spiritually dead person in fear, fear of life, insecurity, being threatened, unsure and uncertain, is to recognize what the love of God has provided for us, what it's given us, and this is most exemplified at the cross where God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so as a result of that, when we come face to face with the love of God at the cross, we know that that 
basic problem of fear is canceled out by the love of God. Now, let's go a step further here in our analysis and look at another passage in the New Testament in Romans 1, 18 to 21. This is one I, again, refer to a lot. Bruce uh, Baker did a great job with Romans 1, 18 to 21 at the pastor's conference just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Tremendous presentation. But this is, again, one of those central passages for understanding people and their motivation in the Scripture. Because this tells us that despite all of the arrogance, all of the pride, all of the denial that you hear from people about God and His existence is just that. It's just camouflage. And it's their camouflage. It's self-created in order to cover up the fact that they are scared to death. At their heart, at their heart of hearts, they are not only scared to death, but they have been taught in our culture that they are nothing more than an accident of, of an electrical discharge, bolt of lightning hitting some kind of blob of protoplasm that brought forth organic life. But they have no meaning. They're just an accident. And you hear this again and again and again. And what we see now in this generation among the... Um, the millennials and then the ones who are, uh, there's another new name I just ran across the other day for the generation that's younger than the millennials that are the teenagers today in the 20-somethings. But the, the rate of suicide in this generation is going off the charts. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that we as Christians have a real answer for people. They're living in existential dread, and and they're overwhelmed by everything that's going on in life. They're scared to death. That's why they're called snowflakes. But we can tap into that as we seek to explain the gospel, that there is meaning, there is hope, there's value in every single human life. But so many of them have lost all of that because it's been drummed out of them through the, the fables and the mythologies that are present in the science classroom. So that doesn't need a whole lot of help because this is the orientation of basically every human being. Romans 1.18 talks about the wrath of God. See, First John talked about punishment. The wrath of God is simply a way, a graphic way of talking about the severity of divine judgment, which of course brings divine punishment. 1 John 4.18, fear has to do with punishment, and there is punishment. There is the justice of God who is going to uh, enact and uphold the standards of God's perfect righteousness, and so the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And the very fact that we have these terms of ungodliness and unrighteousness indicates that, that within every culture there's concepts of right or wrong, even those who believe there's no, there's no basis for, for right or wrong, and you can't say anything absolute, as long as you tell them, well, I don't agree with that, you're wrong, they will react and say, no, you're wrong. They, human beings can't live apart from demonstrating that in their soul there's the idea that some things are right or some things are wrong. Of course, they have... Uh, everything all jumbled up and mixed up in the process, but they believe, just push their buttons at some point, and they will say, you're wrong. I disagree with you as a Christian. You're wrong. You're absolutely out of line. Well, where do you get that value? Where do you get that standard? And so it ultimately that drives us back to show that only when you have a God like the God of the Bible, who is eternally righteous and just, can you have a solid foundation for any kind of values, any kind of morality, and any sort of of, um, ethics? And so this scripture teaches us that God brings judgment against all forms of ungodliness and righteousness of men, and then those men are described as those who suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness. They use unrighteous, they use fables, they use legends, they use fantasies, they use all these different things 
to suppress the truth. And what happens is they adopt in its place delusion. And we see this over and over again. The, the human being who rejects God and the truth of Scripture has to create another origin myth to tell where they came from and what their life is all about and to come up with something to uh, provide meaning uh, for their life. And what this scripture says is they're suppressing the truth because they've rejected God. And, but there's accountability here. Verse 19 says, because what may be known of God Certain things can be known objectively about God, and it's manifest in them. So the first thing that it says is it's internally in their soul, doesn't matter who they are, how much they, they write, and how much they preach, and how much they scream about their, uh, the fact that they don't believe in God. The knowledge of God is manifest in them internally but also externally because God has shown it to them. And then Paul explains how that's done. That's done through the creation, through looking at what we call nature, looking at the stars, looking from, from, from the macro universe, looking at the galaxies and all of the stars, all the way down to the micro universe, looking inside of a cell, looking inside of an atom, all of that uh, manifests or reflects the, the attributes of God so that they are clearly seen. This is seeing with the mind's eye. This is seeing in terms of understanding and comprehending. Uh, they are clearly seeing being understood by the things that are made, even God's eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's the answer to the problem of what about people who never heard the gospel? Well, they, heard, they saw something. There's evidence of God's existence out there, and they either accept it or reject it. But it's enough evidence to hold them accountable for understanding that evidence. And if they reject that evidence, then God's not going to give them any more information. If they want more evidence, then God is going to give them more information all the way to the gospel. So this is what's happening. Inside the human soul, everything in God's creation, as it were, is announcing to each human being, God made me. God exists. God is powerful, God is righteous, and God is just. And man is saying, no, I don't want anything. When I hear that message, I'm scared to death. I am frightened because God is not something that I can control. I need to have something that I can control. And so from the very beginning, we see this kind of reaction to God. Now, I want to skip over to the next book in the Old Testament, which is Exodus, and I want to go to Exodus chapter 19. And we'll see the same kind of thing going on here in Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. Now, the setting here is that God has redeemed the Israelites out of Egypt. They had the 10 plagues. They saw God's power in the 10 plagues. They saw God's power in the 10th plague as God... It over, uh, passed over the Israelites. He did not take the life of the firstborn. He, God made a provision in the uh, Passover lamb that the blood that was applied to the doorpost covered those who were in the house so that they, the uh, firstborn is not uh, taken. But the firstborn of all the cattle and all the herds and all the families of the Egyptians, the firstborn is, dies that night. Pharaoh released them. And then he uh, has a change of mind, and he starts chasing, uh, chasing the uh, uh, Israelites. God parted the Red Sea. So they've seen all this. They've seen God's provision of manna and water in, in the wilderness. They've seen all these miracles. And now they come to uh, Mount Sinai. And there is going to be a meeting with God there on Mount Sinai. And God is going to describe what must happen for the people to come and listen to him. And so in verse 10, God says, to, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. 
and let them wash their garments. So it's ritual cleansing. And the people have to be set apart to God. Why? Because God is holy. Now, what does that word mean? God is holy means he is distinct. He is unique. He is not like anything else. You can't control him. He's not safe. But he's righteous and he's just and he's love. And, and, and in verse 11, God says, Let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So if they had their video cameras and their iPhones, they could have filmed it. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall what? Shall surely be put to death. As interesting as I went through this today, and I'm looking at the Hebrew text, the f grammatical form there is the same thing we have in Genesis 2.7. That the day you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And so it's this, this repetition of the verb. It doesn't mean dying you will die. It means there's a certainty that you will die. Now the death in Genesis 2.17 is a spiritual death that doesn't happen right away. It doesn't, I mean, it, 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 I mean, excuse me, that it happens instantly. The only thing that you can say about Genesis 2.17 and about this grammatical form is whatever it's talking about, it happens instantly. What happened with Adam and Eve is they died spiritually instantly. They don't die physically for over 900 years. And what will happen here when God says they shall surely be put to death is that it's supposed to be an instant capital punishment. They will instantly die physically. So the point I'm making is that this shows that that phrase means something is going to happen immediately. It's not going to be put off for 900 years. Verse 13, and so that's in verse 12. And whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. There's a barrier there. But if you touch the mountain you're going to die instantly. Why? Because that mountain is the presence of God. You are uh, infringing upon God's unique holy ground. This is the same thing that happens to Uzzah with the Ark of the Covenant. What I'm saying is that that event with Uzzah is not out of the ordinary for the Old Testament. This is the norm for anyone who breaches God's righteous presence presence. So in verse 12, we have this, whoever touches uh, the mountain shall surely be put to death. And then the following verses talk about how that would happen. That would be instant. So the people go and they get consecrated. They wash their garments. They get all ready for the third day. And then we read on verse 16, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thundering and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And the Hebrew word there means to tremble in fear. What is the response to God's righteous, holy presence? It's fear. Because God can't be controlled. God is totally other. He is holy. And so as we continue to read down through the account, what we, what we discover is the Lord descends upon, uh, upon the mountain. He comes down to Mount Sinai, and then he speaks to Moses, again reiterating the warning uh, to, for Moses to go warn the people that they don't break through to the Lord. This is in verse 21. I don't have a slide. Look at that. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Verse 22, also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves or else the Lord will break out against them. Guess what that Hebrew word is for break out? It's Paris. Remember what David says? We're going to call this place where Uzzah died, Paris Uzzah. Paris means to break out because here the Lord broke out against Uzzah. It is a term for the... Uh, for the wrath and the judgment of God. And so what happens to Uzzah is not any different 
from what would have happened here. So we, we connect those dots. This is the norm when God's righteousness and justice is violated in this way. So then what happens is God goes, uh, Moses goes down to tell the people, and then God speaks to them. It's audible. If they had a recorder, they could record it. And God gives the what we call the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. It's the prelude to the to the Mosaic Law. Um, and so, when we get down to Exodus 20 verses 18 through 20, we read, "All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, what's their reaction to God? They trembled and stood at a di- distance. There's fear." There's fear because you can't control God. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. See, that's, that's the same word you have over in Genesis chapter, chapter 3. They were afraid. For God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So what I see this pattern that we're developing. Now I want to skip forward to another episode in Numbers. Numbers chapter 16. Where we're going is number 17. But this is a time when the Israelites are in, a, in the wilderness. They have just had their greatest failure in Numbers chapter 13 where they have... Um, rejected God. They have uh, rejected God's provision at the... Um, uh, at Kadesh Barnea, they sent the spies in. The spies came back. Ten said, we can't do it. Two said, we can do it because God promised it. Everybody wants to follow the ten instead of the two. In fact, they want to kill uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb because uh, they don't agree with the others. And that's typically what happens. Those who take a stand for God, everybody else wants to kill them. And so when we get into uh, Numbers chapter 16, there's the rebellion of the priests. There's the rebellion of Korah, who is a Levite, and he's a grandson uh, of Levi, and he and Dathan and Abiram and some other priests lead, lead a revolt against Moses and against Aaron, and as a result of that, uh, what happens? God immediately takes their life. And then we go into chapter 17, and we get into 17, and then at this point, God is going to give an empirical test. He's going to have these uh, priests who want to take over from Aaron's job, and he's going to um, give them a little test. So each one's got to give, give a rod, and they're going to put those in the, in the ta- uh, tabernacle, and the one that sprouts green leaves or buds is going to be the one that God has chosen. By the way, if you look at number 1649, there were 14,700 who died by a plague on account of Korah. So this is not unusual for God to harshly, at the, and I pointed this out last time, at the beginning of certain dispensations or even sub-dispensations, God harshly lays down the law like he does with Ananias and Sapphira in, in, uh, in the book of Acts where they lie against the Holy Spirit and instantly uh, God takes their life. It has to do with uh, protecting and affirming the righteousness and the justice of God. So what we see here is a recognition of this and the people are fearful of God and if we look at numbers 17 12 and 13 as uh, it's recognized that that Aaron has been chosen by God what is the people's response verse 12 so the children of Israel spoke to Moses saying surely we die we perish we all perish whoever even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord must die shall we all utterly die they're scared to death. Why? Because they violated the righteousness and the justice of God. So let's uh, skip forward to one of my favorite episodes in the Old Testament, and uh, we'll just uh, sort of summarize it here to begin with. This is in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah the prophet is taken into the presence of God in heaven, 
And as he is confronted with the righteousness of God, as he hears the seraphim saying, holy, 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 he's confronted with the holiness of God. And it says in verse 5, woe is me for I am unclean, undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He is fearful. Woe is me. I'm going to die. And then one of the seraphim flew to, flew to him, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken back. And this is a literal. This is a picture of the, the, his iniquity being purified. And he says, um, the seraph says, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, it is removed, and your sin purged. That's the Hebrew word kafar, which is the same word translated atonement. And it means to be cleansed, to be purged. You've heard me say this over and over again, that kafar has this idea of cleansing and purging from sin. And this is just another example of it. Now let's continue. I want to look at two more things before we wrap up, or a couple more episodes. When the Ark of the Covenant is taken to Ekron with the Philistines, after it's captured at Aphek and it goes down to, to um, Ashdod and then to Gath and then it comes to Ekron, the, the residents of Ekron have a response to the holiness of God. In First uh, Samuel 5.10, therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So it was as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. There's a recognition that you violate the righteousness of the, uh, of the Jewish God, then you're going to die. And so in verse 11, they sent to all the uh, lords of the Philistines, and they said, send this ark away. We don't want it. It will kill us and our people. And this leads to its being uh, put on the milch cart and sent down to Beth Shemesh. And then when it gets to Beth Shemesh, in 1 Samuel 6.20, the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before the holy Lord God? Have you seen that statement before? Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God and to whom shall it go from us? That's the same basic question that David asks after Uz is killed. He says, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? How is this possible? The thing is, we don't understand God. God is comprehensible to a point, but beyond that, he's incomprehensible. He's eternal, he's infinite, he's righteous, he's just. We can't comprehend it. And so the men of Beth Shemesh, after, all, after God has taken so many Beth Shemites, 50,000 and 70, or maybe it was 70, um, then they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerim to take back the ark. And so they do that, and, for the, and there's peace, and it's there for 20 years until Saul reigns, and then um, throughout Saul's reign, it's basically ignored. David makes this comment in Psalm 119, 120. He says, my flesh trembles for fear of you. You can't control God. There's a book that was written by uh, British pastor, theologian by the name of J.B. Phillips, just a small little book called Your God is Too Small. There were two or three different times in my life when I was taking a course here or there and had to read it. And basic thesis of the book is that most people have this view of God where God's about this big and they can control him. And the thesis of his book is that's too small a view of God. God is outside of your comprehension and your understanding and we need to learn to understand God on his terms as he's revealed in the scripture and not try to reduce him to our level of comprehensibility. In Leviticus 11:44 and 45, God says, For I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Hagias means set apart, distinct or unique, 
He's unique in his righteousness. He's unique in his justice. He's unique in his love. He's unique in his power and in his presence and in his uh, knowledge. He is unique in every area of his attributes. He is one of a kind, and he is not at our level. Uh, In verse 45, he says, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy holy. So this is what must be understood. This is why Uzzah loses his life at this point, because whatever else is going on here, I think it's more than he's just um, reaches out uh, irreverently, uh, because the text says he took, uh, he reached out toward the ark of God in verse 6 and took hold of it, And then in verse 7, it says that God struck him down for his irreverence. There's more to the taking hold of it than simply just touching it, that he is probably looking at it, he's gazing at it, maybe the the cover fell off, and he's looking, he's treating it in a profane manner. And so for that reason, he is uh, struck down. But David has a lesson. A lesson that we've seen has been learned again and again and again since Genesis chapter 3, and that is God is going to do things His way and it's not our way, and that we cannot control what God is going to do. And so this just throws David completely off balance uh, for, for a while before he is able to figure things out and return and do it the right way. So David's response is, like everybody else, David was afraid of the Lord that day. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study this. Be reminded of your uniqueness, of your righteousness, of your justice, of your greatness, of the fact that you are not under our control at all, that that too often our thoughts about you are too small and and, uh, not correct, and that we try to reduce you to a level of our comprehension rather than standing in in absolute awe of you and recognizing that that we need to submit as as Isaiah did before your throne in Isaiah chapter 6. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to expand our comprehension and understanding of you as we study the Scripture, as we read it, and that it impacts the way we think and the way we live. In Christ's name, amen.